Hello, my name is Mary Jane McCallum, and I'm here to introduce the first lecture in a special series about Indigenous health history. The series is sponsored by the Manitoba Indigenous Tuberculosis History Project and is hosted by the Winter 2023 class of University of Winnipeg students in History 3590, Indigenous Health History. It's facilitated by Studio 1L10 and the great staff there at the University of Winnipeg and also by Crystal Payne. In this uh, series, um, we're going to be having uh, speakers do a formal lecture for about 20 to 30 minutes. And at that point, we're going to excuse the registrants who are on Zoom, and we're going to be able to have a class discussion uh, between the students and the invited speaker. So our first lecturer is Miranda Jimmy, a passionate Edmontonian and member of the Thunderchild First Nation. Miranda's professional work has centered on uncovering and amplifying Indigenous histories, and it's this work um, and her commitment to it, especially in the area of Indian hospital history, that draws us to her today. Uh, for many years, she's been researching, documenting, and telling the history of Charles Campbell Indian Hospital in Edmonton, Alberta. This work has led to a documentary on the subject and extensive engagement with the public on the vexing problem of anti-Indigenous racism in Canada. Today, her talk is titled Three Sides to Every Story, Official Records, Community Knowledge, and Living Memory Tell the Truths of Indigenous Hospital Experience. And I'll turn it over to you, Miranda. Tanse Niko Tem. Miranda Jimmy Nesigasun. Amiskwichi Waskahikan Ochi. I join you today from the heart of Treaty 6, Amiskwichi Waskahikan, known to many as Edmonton, the traditional lands of the Blackfoot, the Cree, the Dene, Nakota Sioux, and Soto, and later the Metis and settlers and descendants of settlers from all over the world. Here on the banks of what is currently known as the North Saskatchewan River, Indigenous people have been gathering for time immemorial to share, trade, teach, learn, and celebrate. And I hope it's that same spirit that brings us here today. I want to share with you this image of a place on the western edge of Edmonton. Uh, it's a place I often visit and think about in this work of reconciliation and truth-telling. It's also not far from two burial sites where patients of the Charles Campbell Indian Hospital are buried. It's from this place that I start and I bring to you this conversation today. I want to introduce myself first. Um, as Mary Jane mentioned, I am a member of Thunderchild First Nation. My dad is a residential school survivor, as are many aunts, uncles, cousins, and relatives. At this age in my life, I didn't realize that I was an intergenerational survivor of this trauma. I didn't know about this history and that experience that my family had faced. And I didn't know that that experience would set me on a path of my work, uh, both personally and professionally for the rest of my life. Through the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, I was able to learn more about my family's history including this place that has had such an impact on my family, St. Anthony's Residential School in Onion Lake, Saskatchewan, where my dad attended. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission gave Canadians a gift of truth. And through that truth, we began to learn more about who we are and the wrongs that we've done to each other. This work also helped me to understand my own history um, and how difficult this history is for people to un unravel and understand. When the seventh and final national event of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission happened in Edmonton, um, there were lots of conversations about the work going forward. And there were whispers of the fact that Edmonton, uh, the city proper, didn't hold a residential school and maybe didn't have a place in this work of reconciliation. 
there were several residential schools within close proximity to the city, but none within the city limits. Um, and I realized that people needed to connect with this history in a different way. This isn't just about residential school. This is about all of the systems of genocide and uh, segregation that impacted and continue to impact Indigenous people. And that's when I realized there needed to be more of a light shone on the history of Indian hospitals, specifically that of the Charles Camsell Indian Hospital in Edmonton. The current building stands um, on the western edge of downtown in an uh, area that's becoming gentrified and, and uh, rebuilt as housing uh, becomes an issue in the city. Many know this place uh, if you've lived in Edmonton or passed through for a variety of reasons. You might know it as this derelict building that's been sitting vacant for uh, three decades now. You might remember it as a functioning Indian hospital uh, back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. You may remember it as a provincial hospital in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. But many people are connected to this place in different ways. The original building uh, was on this on this location has this this place has an interesting history. Um, as I began to explore the physical place in which the hospital stands, I learned from elders of Treaty 6 that this location was actually the site of the encampment for Dene and Northern Cree coming to Edmonton to trade at the fort. There's a spot in the river uh, nearby in the ravine that narrows and you can walk across it at certain times of the year. So after the fort uh, shut down and after the Hudson's Bay shut down, this location became a homestead of a Métis family. Later, that family sold the land to the Jesuits and this became the site of a Jesuit college where Jesuit um, missionaries were trained and sent out as the base camp for the Northwest Territories. The Jesuits eventually sold the land to the U.S. Army, and this became the Army base for the building of the Alaska Highway, of which Edmonton is mile zero. After the highway was built, the U.S. Army sold the land to the um, Canadian D Department of National Defense, and this location became a veterans hospital after World War II. Eventually, and overlapping with it being a veterans hospital, it also became an Indian hospital as uh, tuberculosis began to spread. Eventually, it became, as I mentioned, a general hospital, um, which many believe served a majority of Indigenous patients, um, even till its close in 1996. Behind that main building, you saw all these outposts that were um, the barracks in which the um, military officers lived in, which eventually became wards of the, the Indian hospital. So many people who were uh, patients at the hospital remember this, lo this look to the hospital, these little outbuildings that were connected by walkways. And if you were transferred to the hospital, you lived in this little shack um, in this little ward with, you know, four or six or eight other patients, and you never saw the outside. This is an image of the current hospital that was built in 1967 as a centennial project, a gift to the North. It was recognized that healthcare services needed to be provided um, to patients from the North. Um, but instead of building a hospital in the north, they built it in Edmonton, um, and it's the current building that stands today in uh, on the western edge of downtown. The hospital officially closed and was decommissioned in 1996. Um, the building was, you know, only 30 years old and was in uh, fairly good repair at that point, but soon became a derelict building. Some say that the Camsell Hospital is the most haunted place in Edmonton. So for the years after it was closed, many people broke into the location to do ghost hunting and try and find um, spiritual connection in whatever way they could. 
Eventually, the building was sold uh, to a group of developers and is currently being developed into uh, condo buildings as well as new development on the site where um, townhouses and um, single family dwellings are being built. The condos are set for occupation later this year. So whether you know the hospital as uh, a functioning provincial hospital, whether you remember it as an Indian hospital, whether you know it to be this derelict building, whether you are planning to live in it as condos, all of the history intersects with this, in this interesting perspective on it being a healthcare facility. What makes the Charles Campbell Indian Hospital or really any Indian hospital unique is that it contains a variety of records related to experiences there. So it contains health records, which are supposed to have restricted access, which are supposed to have been destroyed after seven years, and which are supposed to have been kept in a central depository. It also impacts or is um, overlapping with a variety of different governments. So different government departments, as I mentioned, Veterans Affairs, Indian Affairs, Provincial Health, um, as well as the local health board. So who is responsible for the records related to this hospital um, intersects at different periods of time. What we also know is that the patients at the hospital were often wards of the state. They didn't consent to the medical treatment that they were provided. Many of them did not speak English. Many were from elsewhere and did not have visitors or advocates that could speak on their behalf to medical professionals. Many stayed for extended periods of time, which included months and years and sometimes even decades. At the height of the Indian Hospital uh, functioning of this facility, upwards of 70% of the patients were being served from um, the Northwest Territories, what is now known as, as Nunavut and uh, the Yukon. So very far away coming here to re receive treatment. How I came to this work was really, as I mentioned, um, by accident. I realized that many Edmontonians, many Canadians did not know the history of Indian hospitals. And it's more complex, I think, it, than um, residential schools because of the complex ways that records and information are, are kept um, and maintained related to these facilities. So what I wanna to talk to you about today is how those different versions of history related to this intersect together. So let's start with the official records. And I put official in brackets be, or in quotation marks because Official is one of those words that is interesting because it depends on who is keeping the records, how official they are and how truthful they are. So when we reference um, and want to do research on Indian hospitals uh, specifically, there are a variety of official records that exist that help to tell the story, to validate a story um, and to maybe give validity to an oral history or a memory that exists. So related to the Charles Campbell Indian Hospital, the documentation that remains today um, is dominated by the staff perspective. So the uh, individuals that were in positions of authority, medical staff, record keeping staff that were responsible for keeping records, they decided what was written down, what was kept and what was passed on to the archives for, um, for memory, uh, to that memory institution. Rarely do the official records or the documents that exist in archives uh, provide an unbiased perspective on the patient experience. So those, those staff and those individuals that were in positions of power had the opportunity to decide what information was kept, whose voices were amplified, and um, you know, if any of the experiences or records decided to shine a bad light on an experience, those were often tossed and not kept. Also, you'll see in the official records that it does perpetuate this narrative of doing good rather than harm. 
So in my experience in talking to former staff, as well as reading through the official records, they talk about the good parts, the fact that hospitals were provided, healthcare was provided, that patients were treated and had an option to be treated. Um, so all of those are good things. Perhaps there were life-saving measures that um, if there was not that medical intervention, then patients would have passed away in their home communities. But rarely does it talk about the harm that was done in the approach that this medical care was given. So as I mentioned, many of the patients did not consent to the care that they were provided. There was experiments done on the patients without their consent. They were often given different treatment than they would have for non-Indigenous patients. And they were taken away from their communities, their families, their cultures, and those connections that would have helped with their medical treatment in different ways. Oftentimes, um, again, this is um, reflective of the period is there wasn't a, a look at the holistic health of an individual. So it was about medical treatment, not necessarily about mental health supports or cultural supports that would have benefited them in many ways. So there's different types of official records that exist. Um, there are government records related to the hospital. So as I mentioned, there are um, different government organizations and departments that were involved. Um, records are, are located in a variety of places, including Library and Archives Canada in Ottawa, the Provincial Archives of Alberta here in Edmonton, the City of Edmonton Archives, um, various academic institutions nationally and internationally, as well as private collections nationally and internationally. So these records came across um, and were kept in many different ways. Uh, there are records still being donated to the archives today that people are finding in boxes of basements as people pass away. Um, staff members kept records, that kind of thing. They include textual records, physical um, objects, as well as photographs. The other thing that um, makes that makes um, the Charles Camsell unique is they had something called the Camsell Arrow. The Camsell Arrow was um, a monthly, sometimes uh, bi-monthly, sometimes quarterly newsletter that existed. It um, contained memos from the staff. It contained staff announcements um, to the patients and it contained writings and pictures made by the patients. Anyone could subscribe to the Camsell Arrow and you could receive this back home. So many, in many cases, it was an opportunity for um, home communities to hear about what was going on with their loved ones at the hospital in Edmonton. Um, included also was world news, clippings from the newspaper, jokes, um, and editorials about people's experience. I, I look at the Camsell Arrow as a little bit of a glimpse into what it was like to be in the hospital. Also related to um, the records that exist, and I say the official records, are um, newspaper clippings. And the newspaper clippings were talking about um, what was going on at the hospital, what was happening with Indian Health Services, what was happening with um, Indigenous affairs across the country. Um, so these are also contained in the official records. The photographs that exist for um, in the archives are also challenging in the fact that many of them contain names associated with the staff and their position, but very few of the patients are actually named or recognized. So again, it is um, an example of um, the authority and positions of power that staff had in deciding what information was kept, who was recognized, and how those people were honored. In many cases, I don't think that the patients were even um, consented to their photos being taken. I've seen many of these photos exist in private collections that staff took on their own personal cameras, um, and those have been transferred now to the archives.
So one of the considerations with all of these official records is that archives are for the privileged. So my experience, I'm not a trained historian. I don't have any academic letters behind my name. And I fell into this work of archival research really by chance. So in learning how to access archives, I had to figure out how to navigate those systems, how to ask the right questions, how to get the right access, who could help me on that journey, and then start to challenge those systems to make sure that the individuals that could benefit from reading and accessing the archives, um, I started to break down those barriers. So archives are, are for the privileged for academic researchers is why they exist and the systems are set up to privilege them. Archival practices of um, accessioning and deaccessioning also impact what exists today and in, in the future. So at one point when, when the documents were donated to the archives or transferred to the archives, a decision was made by an archivist what was going to be kept and what was going to be um, discarded. Also, as the archives fill up, the, the deaccessioning de, uh, continues and choices are made about what information is important to be kept um, and who should be accessing it, what information is digitized and publicly accessible. And all of those, again, privilege a certain group of people. Often what happens is what exists in the official records of the archives is taken as fact and perpetuated and rarely challenged. So if it, if it exists in black and white, if it exists in a document, it must be true. Oftentimes we don't take the, the second to think about who wrote it, what position they had, and what other information might challenge what's exist, what exists in the written record. The most important thing to realize is that people are turned into objects and subjects and lose their voice. So who is represented and whose story is represented in the official record? There's never an opportunity or rarely an opportunity for that individual to challenge what is written about them, what is shared of their own individual health history or personal information, and, um, and who has access to that. So, this goes back to the fact that researchers in, in accessing archives are only getting one part of the story. So if official records tell one part of the story, um, the second part, which I think is really important, is that of community knowledge. And what I mean by community knowledge is, um, is the stories that have been passed down that live in these communities that are connected to the hospital. So in the case of the Charles Camsell Hospital, uh, we're talking about all of Western and Northern Canada um, received patients at this hospital. And so um, in individual, sometimes remote or very rural um, separate communities, there are versions of the story, what they know happened at the hospital, what they know from uh, family members, from um, from community members and individuals and those stories have been passed on. So when I think about this, this is the examples of, um, you know, I know so-and-so was sent to the hospital um, and never came home. And so what information is captured that is separate from what exists in the official record? So the oral and written history of these communities um, that exists separately in these often segregated and siloed communities that will never be captured or never challenge what exists in the official record. What I've heard is that, you know, families in the North didn't really get a lot of communication about what happened to their loved ones. Um, and in some cases, those loved ones didn't come home. And, you know, and then if they didn't come home, well, where are they? And in some cases, where are they buried? In fact, Inuit are buried in St. Albert, and uh, she just buried them there, not even with the headstone.
So the considerations with this community knowledge is that often oral histories are rarely documented or that they exist in, um, in those little pockets um, spread across the country. The stories tend to lose detail over time, so may not be able to directly overlay with a document or with a photograph or with um, something that validates it. As I mentioned, they're siloed and often contained separate from one another. So um, those communities each have this oral history or this living memory amongst community members that is rarely um, compared with other communities' experiences. Often this community knowledge is not taken as fact, as fact, especially when it's different or challenges the record and the narrative that exists in the official record. So if official records um, exist in a silo and community knowledge exists in a silo, there's also the idea of living memory. So this is the firsthand experience of those who experienced a connection to the hospital either as a patient or as a staff member and have a living memory connected to that. So it is their lived experience um, that they remember and they experience themselves. So these experiences can be memories, um, mementos that they have connected to the hospital. It can come from patients, from family members of patients, uh, visiting them at the hospital, medical staff, administrative staff, elected officials who um, help to fund or run the hospital, the decision makers, or even the neighbors in the neighborhood of the hospital. I was working uh, for government as a translator in Ottawa, and they used to send me here to Edmonton to visit the hospital and other places that had Inuit in it. I'm seeing kind of images of nurses and patients and orderlies. And it, it, it's such an interesting way to look at this, this building, how it has uh, been helpful to people, helped them live, and on the other hand, has contributed to the demise of some of their cultures. I came to the council because it offered a, a very different experience. It was a federal government hospital. It moved to an entirely different rhythm because of the kind of patients that we received. So we had patients down from trap lines up north all over the place and you couldn't move people in and out quickly depending on how they could access, whether it be through ice roads, you know, rivers, whatever. We had to work with the rhythm of their lives which impacted the rhythm of how we, we worked with them. There were efforts, much like residential schools, to create segregated systems, to have isolation. And when I think about the number of illnesses that spread, that piece of the history I think is very dark. I've also talked to a lot of people that said, at least when there was a hospital that said the word Indian on it, we knew that we were welcome there. So it's interesting to me how those two sides, uh, segregation but feeling a sense of belonging, how they can play out for different people in different ways. I don't know what it was about Charles Campbell, but it's just a sense of you belong. Being around with other First Nations and being around with other people in this hospital it was just, it was like a sense of touch of home. And it was comfortable because it was the Aboriginal, it was the native hospital people that were the native uh, in the city came here and they could see other native people and other native patients. And that made them feel a little more, or maybe a little less threatened. I was in the residential school for eight, eight years. The, the health department decided to launch a x-ray campaign, a portable campaign to go to Northern Reserves. Those that had TB were sent here to a Charles Council. There was no cure for TB in those years. That I remember just bed rests eh, and, and good food. That's the 
father died first in 46, and then mother a year later. And my the two little sisters and two little brothers, one died immediately. They just had no chance with that tuberculosis. This is hard to comprehend sometimes when you think back by today's standards, eh? Uh, being a patient for so long. Yeah. And when I left, finally, uh, I got to Grewer in Alberta. Well, I missed the old camp, so. <laughs> I thought this was the only, this was the home I knew. Yeah, it's, that's the way that was. So I met John when I was filming the documentary that Mary Jane mentioned at the beginning. And um, John told me about uh, how he uh, drew pictures for the Camsel Arrow when he was a patient. So I found uh, copies of that for him. One of the most challenging things with living memory is that individuals pass away. Um, John passed away in two, uh, during the pandemic in 2021. Um, and actually three people who were part of the documentary that I produced in 2016 have since passed away. So considerations with living memory, similar to community knowledge, oral histories are rarely documented. Stories tend to lose detail over time. They're siloed and contained separate from one another and often not taken as fact when they challenge the documented record. Individuals pass on and that memory passes along with them. Um, also, competing narratives or perspectives are often disregarded. Two patients could have been in the same room at the same year and receive different treatment and remember different experiences. Really what I wanna leave you with is this idea that truth is a combination of many things. It is the official records that exist that tell the official story um, as documented in the archives that individuals and researchers can access into the future. It exists in the community knowledge that individuals remember and share as part of that story. And it exists in the living memories of those who experienced it firsthand. Ultimately, when all of these things overlap, that's when you find the truth. With all Indian hospital history, we need to think about challenging the narrative. What is the story being told? Who owns those stories um, to be told? And what perspectives are being pr privileged and perpetuated? Knowing that the official record is dominated by one version of the story, how do we challenge that by encouraging more individual and community knowledge perspectives? Who's responsible for challenging, challenging this record? Who's responsible? Um, what is the responsibility of researchers and historians in this work? What is the responsibility of archives and memory institutions? And what role can community knowledge or living memory play in challenging all of this work? Lastly, who should have access? Who should be responsible for gathering and caring for this information? What restrictions should be placed on the information? and where should the information be located? Going forward, who is responsible for continuing this work? As, an, as a community researcher, I do this as volunteer on my volunteer time and try and help individuals navigate these systems, but there is a community and public responsibility for this work. Ultimately, this costs money and who should pay for it? I thank you for listening uh, to the conversation today. I am grateful for those who joined us from across the country, and I look forward to the student conversation afterwards. Thank you. Thanks so much uh, for joining us, everybody who came in on Zoom. Um, we're gonna let you go now, but I hope you can join us again for another um, lecture in this uh, lecture series, History 3590. Uh, Indigenous health history. Thanks. <laughs>